Uh, if, if you are here on a regular basis, you, you know that we, every week we, we post what we're going to talk about, and, and I usually put some notes and stuff in the bulletin, uh, and, and you'll, no, you'll notice this morning that that's not there. Um, and, and there's a particular reason for that. Um, this has been a very, very difficult week here. Um, and many of you may not actually know that, uh, but we, we have experienced some turbulence, if you will. Um, and it's interesting because it wasn't six days ago, seven days ago, that I made this, this really funny analogy to what it's like uh, to be in a plane and you hear, you experience some turbulence. And, and what do you hear when you're in that plane? You don't hear the pilot going, oh crap, uh, this is going to be rough guys, you should... Uh, don't, but don't worry, it's going to be okay. We, we hear the, this calm voice from the pilot that says, ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. We're going to experience a little bit of turbulence. We're going to get it through it just fine. Yeah, right? I made that analogy. Maybe you were here, maybe you weren't. But I made that analogy. And God, in his infinite wisdom and, and, and humor, uh, decided that maybe now would be a good time to learn how to practice what you preach. Because that's what happens in life, isn't it? Like, it, it, it doesn't matter if it happened here in the church or if it happens in your own life on a day-to-day basis. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's this great, big, massive thing or if it's all the little things that we focus, or that we, we, we experience. The, the reality is, is that we experience turbulence in our lives. We experience struggles in our lives. And so... I want to invite you in, actually, uh, to the honest reflections of what I've been going through this week. And the only thing that I know to do in these moments, and this isn't because I'm a pastor, it's because it, it, it's born out for me of my faith and, and what I believe to be true about Scripture and what I believe to be true in Scripture. And so I don't have notes for you and I don't have verses for I have lots of verses for you. Uh, but I, I just want to invite you into this. And uh, I wrote down some stuff this morning because that's, that has been the time that, we've been able, that I, I've been able to, to give to this. So, um, but we know and we believe that when we open the Word of God, He speaks. And He does what He does through His Holy Spirit. And so we pray, come Holy Spirit, invade our hearts and invade this place that we can be renewed, refreshed, sustained through it. Right? We talked in the last couple of weeks through, the book, uh, through Romans chapter 8. And, and we heard verses like this, I consider that our present suffering is not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. We, we looked at James for a little bit, right? Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. <laughs> yeah, right? Because we know that the suffering or the testing of our faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. We read scripture like this. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know, and this is a big, big point of trust and trying to figure out this week. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. We're all in this process. When, when we are in Christ, when we have faith in Christ, we're all in this process of sanctification, this process of development, of growth. And God grows us in uh, a very wide and, and, and deep amount of ways. But in all these things, we know that he's working for our good. And so in a week like this week for me, uh, there's a lot of questions about how this could possibly be good. But we trust. Scripture says it. I'm wrestling with it. I don't get it yet. But the reality is, God says it's good and I'm working for your good. And so I have to believe that on some level. Right? It says, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Okay. That's what we preached about. And so here's some of my reflections. The first thing we do 
the first thing I asked our consistory to do in this week was to pray. In all things, we go to our Lord in prayer. We stop because we need to. Pause. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In doing so, we make a conscious choice to put on the armor of God. Because let me tell you right now, this week was a week that was full of of anxiety for me, a week that was full of of tears, of pain, of difficulty, as, as we grappled with difficult events that were happening, difficult things. And, and just, just for the record, I'm not here to start rumors, and you shouldn't listen to rumors. I'm not here to dig up things, and it's really not my place to talk about all of what has happened, because it's not resolved yet, and we're still working on it. We're having conversations, and we're doing these things, so don't, please, I just want to speak against this right now. Don't spend the rest of this time trying to figure out what happened. It's not worth it. The reality is we face suffering, we face trials in every situation of our lives. And the who and the what is is not important when we look into Scripture. What is important is how we focus on God in these times. And what God calls us to do is this. Put on the... Right? He says, finally, and this is Ephesians 6. You may remember this passage. We, we preached through it uh, about a year ago now. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stands against the devil's schemes. Because the reality of our struggles is this right here. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We face a real enemy who is out to get us. And when we want to move forward in ministry, when we want to move forward in the gospel, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, the enemy hates it. And the gloves come off and he goes after us. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the authorities and the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, when those struggles come, when those trials come, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with a belt of truth buckled around your waist and with a breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. Pray also for me. That whenever I speak, words may be given me that I may, that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in change. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And James writes this too. If any one of you ask, lacks wisdom, you should ask God kind of makes sense, who generally gives generously to all those without finding fault. And it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like the wave, like the wave of a sea blown and tossed by the wind. It's a pretty tall order when the world seems to be crashing in around us. But it's what Scripture calls us to do. To pray. To arm yourself. To go to the Sovereign One through whom and to whom all things hold together. So we pray. And we ask. And God in His gracious mercy gives us all that we need. Is any one of you in trouble? Let them pray. Is any one of you happy? I'm singing songs of praise. It's not just about the troubled times. It's about all the times. Where are you at in your life? You should pray. We should always go to our good shepherd. And so we ask the consistory to pray. And we've been praying this week. We've been praying against rumors. We've been praying against uh, uh, mistrust. We've been praying against all of these other things that that Satan always tries to use and tries to instill in us, right? When, when something goes wrong, we say, D- can God actually handle this? Is God actually good? 
is, what, what is actually going on here? We pray against that. And we trust God through the good times and the bad. Which is really easy to say. And a little bit more difficult to enact. Yeah? The second thing I ask the consistory to do is reflect. We had some difficult conversations. And it was hard. The first thing that Scripture calls us to do in these moments is literally not to worry. And Jesus teaches this. Don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or your body about what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? And he goes on, right? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap. He's talking about a sparrow, right? You've, seen, you've all seen a sparrow at some point in time, right? There's a gazillion of them around. And God doesn't allow even one thing to happen to a sparrow, these overpopulated birds that don't even know how to fly south for the winter sometimes. Right? And some of them, <laughs> right? God cares for us so much more than that. Right? The flowers of the field, these things that, that bloom into beautiful existence and die almost as quickly, it seems like. And God clothes them in beautiful splendor and cares for them in such a way that they can go on and on every year, blooming, making the earth beautiful. And God cares for us infinitely more than the flowers of the field. Do not worry about your life, Scripture says. Right? We take the focus off of us, off of ourselves, and place it back on God where it belongs. Right? It says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We go to Scripture. And we hear words like this, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. Therefore, because of who God is, we will not fear. Though the earth give way, though the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam and the mountains quake, they're surging. Right? That's a lot. That's a pretty big earthquake is what he's talking about there. And in the midst of that, we will not fear. As a matter of fact, Scripture calls us to be still. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Right? We just read in Romans, if God is for us, who can be against us? Think of the I think of the, um, the narrative of Israel, right? They're leaving Egypt. God has finally freed them. Everything looks good. They're, they're headed out and, and they, they're no longer slaves and they get up to the Red Sea and what happens? Pharaoh comes after them. And they're like, seriously. You've ever had one of those, you, you've had one of those moments in your life. It's like, we just got through something and, and things seem to be going good and all of a sudden it's like, pff, the other foot, the other shoe drops. You know what I'm talking about, right? And you're like, come on. I can't catch a break here. And, and what does God say? What is, Moses says these words uh, to the, the people of Israel as they're cornered against the Red Sea. They're either going back to slaves or they're going to die because that's, that's the only thing that's happening right now. And, and Moses says this, the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Right? Pharaoh's army's coming after them and they're freaking out. And they're like, we're going to die. It's, it's, you know, there's nothing left. We're, we're done, right? They're saying their last goodbyes and all these things. And, and Moses says, shh, shh. Don't worry about it. God's got this. All I need you to do is be still. Be still and know that I am God. <laughs> and so we reflect. We slow down. Where is my part in this? How am I related to what's going on? Where do I need to trust? Where have I lost focus? Lord, you have searched me and you know me. 
You know when I sit down. You know when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before you lay your hand upon me. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. That's hard to do. When it feels like you have to react at every single second and you're not sure what's going to come next, Scripture bids you be still. That's rough. That's hard. How many people are really good at that? Right? We're not. Of course not. And so we grapple with it. The next thing. The next thing that we do is we listen. How many people are really good listeners? <gasps> like one or two, right? <laughs> How many people are really good at, at, at talking and, and coming up with a response before they're even done with a sentence? Only one or two. All right, the rest of you are somewhere in there, right? <laughs> Depends on the day, maybe. James writes, everybody should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because human anger doesn't produce the righteousness that God desires. We've been talking through Romans, and in, in Romans he talks about the fact that when we, when we come to Christ, we put off our old selves, that we are a, a new creation, as it were. And, and, and Paul expands on this in, in different areas of the New Testament particularly in Colossians where he says, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with humility and compassion and kindness and gentleness and patience and bear with each other and forgive each other. If anyone has a grievance against someone, forgive. Wait for it. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Whoo. Whoo. And you can say it, right? I mean, this is like an audible gasp. Like, oh, that's a big deal. <laughs> Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love. What Paul is talking about here, he, he, he says, clothe yourselves with these things. And the assumption here is that, that you're therefore taking off other things, right? This is like getting out of your work clothes that you came home in that are sweaty, dirty, grimy, awful, that no one, not even your, your spouse wants to wash, right? Like, Get undressed in the garage kind of clothes. You know what I'm talking about? Come on, nobody? Nobody has that, right? Yeah, it's like the, the, the other... So uh, when, when the snow was melting, we let Anaya go out and, uh, and romp around in all the freezing cold mud puddles. And she, 45 minutes in freezing cold mud puddles, not a peep about being cold. Like, because she was filthy. Like, wet head to toe, caked in mud from head to toe. It was a sight to behold. And so, and, and in March, right, what did we do? She came up to the door and Bethany goes, uh-uh. Nope. She gets undressed right there. I'm like, it's March. Didn't matter. That's the kind of junk that Paul is assuming we're taking off as we clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and putting on love over all of it. And when we do that, we let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. Isn't that a beautiful thing? John? Please. Amen. Amen. And that's a, that is a word right there. That's a good word. <laughs> when life is sad, God is good. When life is unfair, God is good. There were three other days too. When life is a struggle, God is good. Anyone else? When life is good, God is good. We like that one. Yeah? Who likes that one? When life is good, God is good. The other four, we struggle with and we wrestle with a bit. Yeah? 
But God is good. It's true. And so when we do this, when we do this and we find that peace in our hearts, and, and this is a, a peace that I've had to wrestle with all week long, trying to come to like a, a level place again where, where I can focus on God. Because seriously, when you get hit, it, it, it throws your focus off. It, it totally does. And, and I'm just as, as, as susceptible and as, as guilty as the next person. It happens. But when we do this, it directs our heart back towards God and it directs our heart back towards a path towards reconciliation the way that Scripture intends. And so I want to talk about this, but I want to make a note about this again. I said it before and I will say it again. The details of what happened this week are inconsequential to the truth of Scripture. They are completely inconsequential. It does not matter. Right? Things happen, they always happen. You know it's true in your life. It happens in, it happens in businesses, it happens in churches, it happens everywhere. So if you're here for the first time, right, sorry, we are an imperfect church. <laughs> and it's just a reality of, of who we are as human beings trying to follow Christ the best that we can. And so we're kind of like, you know, sort of halfway airing our dirty laundry, it feels like. But the, the reality is, is that when we, when, we re, when we reflect and we listen, and we, we listen especially to God and to each other, what we do is we, we fulfill what Scripture calls us to do to reconcile to each other. And, and I say this with a reflection of the... I, I, want, I want to offer this reflection. Because it's, it, it was true this week, but it's been true for years. We live in this new digital age where a conversation or a picture or a meme sparks offense. And the first thing that we do is we close the book on that relationship and say, I'm done. I'm out. It's over. It's, it's normal for us in our lives to just walk away rather than move towards reconciliation. Walking away feels easier, but at the end of the day, reconciliation is what God calls us to, and it's what the Spirit calls us to. And when we don't follow this, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's at work, whether it's in our family, whether it's in our church, we essentially are robbing the Spirit and robbing God of the opportunity to do a work of healing in our lives, to shower love and relationship, and to show support from the community of faith. We miss all of that when the only thing that we do is, is, is turn away. And, and I say that with the utmost love because, friends, it happens often. When we talk about people to other people, when we, when we triangulate things, whatever it is, when we feel offended or hurt by the things that somebody has said, Scripture is very clear that calls us into that relationship, not out of it. At least not at first not our first response. We no longer, right, the, the world, the world is like, just click unfriend, be done, right? They have different political views, be done. Who cares, right? They're not your friend anyways. You don't need to hear from them. It just makes you feel bad, right? Whatever it is, that, that coworker that, that throws you under the bus at work to your boss, whatever it is, the world says, just be done. But scripture says this, we now, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. We are different. We've talked about this. Our sanctification, this process of progressive spiritual development where we're putting off sin and, and becoming more and more like Christ, it means we look different than the world. It means that things are changing in us, right? The, the old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. In other words, part of being in Christ is called, is, is being called to reconcile to others. To lean into these relationships no matter what. That God was reconciling himself, reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. 
Now, this is a really easy concept for us to grasp when we talk about outreach and evangelism, right? We're Christ's ambassadors to the people over there and to the people out there and to those people out there. You know who else we're Christ's ambassadors to? The people in here. That as a church, we are representing Christ to each other through our lives and through our love. And that we have to do that. It's part of who we are in Christ. Right. Let's read verse 20 again. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. As if God was literally speaking through us in the actions that we take towards other people when we are following what Scripture calls us to do. God, who made him to, God made him who had no sin to be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. What powerful, powerful language from Scripture that calls us into deeper relationships. Not to keep everybody at arm's length. And let's be honest, we can be really good at doing this. We can be really good at putting the walls up and defending all the time, trying to protect ourselves. And it's hard. I'm just as guilty. Listen, right? Let me, can I just be straight honest with you right now? All of you, to me, are dangerous. You know why? Because it only takes a few of you to start rumors for me to lose my job. I'm just going to be honest. Let's be, can, I, can, can I just say that right now? I'm just going to be honest, right? It happens in churches all the time, right? And so the natural thing to do is to go, I'm just going to stand up here. I'm just going to preach what people want to hear. And everything's going to be okay. Is that what the Bible calls us to do? It's not. The reason that when there's struggles in church and it, it, it's so hard, right? The reason that this week was so awful for me is because of how, like, how much I love this place and how much I love each and every one of you and how hard and how painful it is to see other people in pain. I hate it. I, I despise it. And I certainly despise it for the family of God. And so at the risk of, you know, getting myself fired every single week, right, we preach the word because that's what God calls us to. But we preach it in love. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Like, uh, again, right, justice in Christ, God forgave you. Jesus says in the Beatitudes, he turns everything on its head. Blessed are the peacemakers, right? Who are the people that get ahead in this world? They're the people that walk all over, climb up the corporate ladder, da-da-da-da-da. And Jesus says, nah. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And he says this too. If you, if you are going into worship, and, and this, is, this is a reference to the temple, right? If you're bringing your offering to the altar, essentially he's saying if you go into worship and you have an issue with one of your brothers or sisters, you should go home and fix it. You should be reconciled to them and then come back and offer your worship. How many of us in this room right now have a family story struggle or a squabble or an issue with somebody at work or something that's going on where we're mad at them and, and, and we're, we're pushing away from them rather than engaging in, in a process of reconciliation. Right? Be honest. We, I'll be honest. Right? We all do. At some point in times in our lives, we all do. And Jesus lays out for us exactly what we're called to do. If you've been sinned against... Go to that person and talk to them about it. Tell them about it. Why? To make them feel bad? No, because if you do, if you engage in that super awkward conversation that is like super weird and hard and painful and you, I mean, we just don't want to do it because it's, it's, right? Who am I to judge? Blah, 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 blah. I'm just going to take it and I'm going to walk away. Actually, if you do that, you do it so that you can win them over. 
Or in other language, so that God can win them over. It turns everything that we know about conflict on its head. A psychologist would be like, hey, there's somebody that's making you mad. Just, you know, be done with it, right? Put it off in your mind and be done with it. But the reality is, is that Scripture actually calls us to that relationship, not away from that relationship. And in doing so, we, we actually contain the pain that goes along with it. And we create an environment where the Spirit can work and draw the two people together. And that's where we start to see the true outgrowth of be of the same, have the same mind of Christ Jesus. Be unified as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's beautiful and it's completely countercultural. And it's hard. It's so hard. It's so incredibly difficult. Because the first thing it requires is for us to do that work. <laughs> We'd rather just put it off. And there's a lot more to that, right? If they don't receive you, then, then go with a couple of people from the church or go with some of the elders from the church. If not, go with the leadership from the church or go with them to the church. If they still refuse to listen, if they still refuse to listen and they have sinned against you, because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's, the, it's their sin that they're choosing to live in over Christ. That's countercultural too. But it's important. And I'd be willing to wager my career on the fact that if we engage in reconciliation like this, we would see relationships in this church flourish beyond anything we could possibly imagine. We would see relationships in our families be healed through the power of the Holy Spirit. If we engage in reconciliation like this, we would see the relationships in our workplace and all throughout our lives and all the spheres of influence that we find ourselves in, we would see true flourishing and we would see the power of God at work everywhere we go if we're obedient to Scripture. It's difficult. It's, quite frankly, a little awkward. But it's true. It's true. It's this sort of air of thankfulness that, that Paul brings up that, that we have. Right? I thank God every time I remember you in all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. What a beautiful thing to say to the people of God that he's writing to. To each and every person who does things, who, who is a part of this body in your own unique way, in your own unique gifts, we are thankful for each and every one of you. And we believe that God who began a good work in you, will carry it through to completion on the day of Christ. This scripture is challenging and it's, it's difficult. But ultimately, the work that God can do through it in you and in those with whom you have conflict is unimaginable. Unimaginable. And I honestly believe, because Scripture says it, that we are on this journey together as a church and as individuals, walking down this road of, of sanctification that Christ is doing in us right now. And that this is just one part of this great journey of transformation that God is doing in us. It's a practical and real application of what God calls us to when we put our faith in Jesus Christ.
So we come back to Romans. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave himself up for us, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who can bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is, it? Who, who is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died. The one who died for our sins and more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and he is also interceding for us. This, this Jesus who, who died for our sins, who cleared us of the condemning power of the law, is the one who sits next to God saying, nope, that one's mine. This one's mine. That son, daughter, son, daughter. You can't have them say, in, it's over. Follow me. So who can separate us from the love of Christ? This is a big question this week too. When the world seems to be falling in, when everything seems to be going wrong, what can separate us from the love of Christ? In trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or, or uh, danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Yeah, we're going to face sin. We're going to face evil. We're going to face the realities of this world each and every day. But in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither life nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And no matter what you're going through in your life, no matter what you're dealing with, whether your life is good and you're celebrating that God is good or whether your life is sad or struggling or unfair or whatever, God is good and nothing in this world can take that away. And Scripture says it. And so it has to be true. We have to believe it. What do we do? I don't know where you are in this week. I don't know whether church troubles bother you like they bother me. I don't know uh, if, you've, if you've been dealing with, with work issues or home issues or life issues or, or whatever. But God calls us in Scripture to these things. And I know they're not easy and I know we have to work them out. But at the end of the day, the writer of Hebrews calls us to this. It says, because we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Y'all, that's us right here. That's us in this room. That's us, the people that are on vacation too. Like, we're bring everybody in, right? That's all of us. That is the body of Christ that we are associated with throughout the world. We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run this race with perseverance, the race that he has marked out with us, and let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Because of the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, he scorned its shame, and he's seated now at the right hand of God. Right? Satan brings a lot of stuff into our lives. And I don't know where you are this morning, I don't know what you're dealing with, but Satan's ultimate goal, distract and destroy. Throw him off course. And so the, Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews says, and, and you can read all of Hebrews, and I would super recommend that. It's such a great book. Right. After everything he says, Christ has come. He is the one. He is the only one. He is all that we need. So no matter what it is that we're dealing with, let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we're going into the fall. Yeah, it's been a little rocky. Yeah, it's been a little struggle. But we as a church fix our eyes on Jesus and Jesus alone. He has called us to ministry here in Hopkins. He has called us to a gospel message to bring and see captives free, to see dead people be raised to life and come to Jesus, to see the sick be healed. He has called us to this and we will forever fix our eyes on him. And we will throw off the things that hinder us. And that's not, for the record, we're not talking about people. We're talking about those principalities and powers and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Those things we be rid of. 
We pray for cleansing. We pray for healing. So that we can move forward in Christ. Fixing our eyes on Him. Never wavering. No matter what comes our way. Because nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Let's pray. So Lord, a lot of that is really easy to say. It's really easy to read. Um, And so, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would make it a reality in each one of us. That wherever we are and whatever we're wrestling with right now, Father, that you would work out your will and your good for us. And Lord, that you would give us confidence and courage to trust you in the midst of it, whatever it is. And Father, as we move forward in our lives and in the life of the church into this fall education, new discipleship season, Lord, as as small groups and Sunday school and youth group and all of the things, uh, Lord, get started again. Things like fifth quarter. All of these opportunities that you have placed before us to minister to this town that you have called us to. God, we pray Lord, that you would be at the center of our focus, that in all that we do, in all that we are, Lord, all of it would be for your honor and your glory. Father, we pray, Lord, for each of each person in this room today. You have called us together as a family, and Lord, you have called us to bear each other's burdens. So, Lord, we pray that you would give us the grace to do that well that you would give us the grace to hold each other up, to push each other on towards love and good deeds. And Lord, that we would indeed be able to clothe ourselves with love, with compassion, with gentleness, with humility. So that we can be your ambassadors and that you can continue to work through us here at Hopkins Community Church, here in this Hopkins community that you've called us to, and Lord, in the world. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.